So in this video, I speak once again with Stephen Elliott, who is the original creator of the coherent breathing technique and the life scientist behind so much of the fundamental research into the origins of coherence. He's also the president of Coherence, and I'll leave a link down below to his website. Uh, in this video, we discuss some of the elements of the science, some of his discoveries and inventions into how to measure coherent breathing, um, as well as, again, some tips for how to get the most out of your coherent breathing. So Stephen, thank you so much for joining me again. You say in the New Science of Breath uh, that coherent breathing results in meditation. And yeah. for me, that, that those words really summarize the power of, of this because in my own experience and my own kind of opinions about this, I really think that coherent breathing has far greater potential than how mindfulness meditation has been standardized and distributed in the West. And I think that's partly because of its simplicity and accessibility. Um, and I know that you have a profound interest in how it can be used to treat hypertension. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, do you think there is a limit to the potential of coherent breathing in terms of what it can do and who it can help? Uh, no, Tom, uh, you know, I've, what I've tried to do over the 25 years really of research I've done on this is uh, to expand my understanding of what's happening. And uh, my current summary of, of that is uh, in the graphic that demonstrates the totality of fluid in the body and, and how that fluid is uh, managed and serviced by the uh, by the circulatory system. And uh, long and short of it is that there are 42 liters of fluid in the average adult body. And only five uh, of those liters uh, is blood. However, uh, the, the remaining uh, 37 liters are dependent on the activity of the blood. Now, it's generally thought of in Western medicine that the five liters of blood in the uh, circulatory system uh, make the rounds uh, one time per minute. So five liters of flow through the arterial and venous tree per minute. And um, if we look at the average adult, there is a heartbeat uh, visible uh, in the ear, in the finger, looking at it with plethysmograph. Um, but in general, there is no wave activity that one can see. And if we uh, begin to breathe coherently now, uh, this wave act, uh, activity, what we refer to as the Valsalva wave, will begin to build. And it will build to an optimal level. And um, my back of the envelope uh, math suggests that this additive uh, a mode of force for the blood to move pr primarily as a function of the elasticity, a compliance and elasticity of the lungs uh, as a function of the diaphragm movement. And the same is true of the, uh, of the uh, abdominal cavity mm. that uh, this doubles the mode of force for uh, blood to move through the circulatory system and sets up wave activity across the pervasive capillary circulation in the body such that the remaining 37 liters of fluid that exist on the other side of that uh, capillary barrier is serviced properly. And that's where all the cells in the body reside uh, by and large, except those uh, of the blood itself. So our objective uh, for health is really cellular health at the microscopic level. And we are, uh, we're interested in making sure that fluid exchange um, with every cell in the body is, is uh, proper. And I argue for that to happen um, because we're vertical beings that we must use our diaphragms to generate wave action to complement uh, the motive force generated by the heart to facilitate a movement of blood flow upward against gravity. Mm. So that is, that's where my head's at right now regarding the totality of, of uh, the importance of, of breathing uh, slowly, deeply, and rhythmically is to generate the wave so as to uh, increase the health of uh, every cell, uh, particularly those in the brain where I'm, I'm concerned about uh, humanity in, in this regard. 
uh, I'm not sure with that we're uh, that we're seeing optimal mental functioning. Mm. So this, so it's almost like the because we're missing the the circulatory power of our diaphragm, we're not getting optimal circulation. That's and as soon as we re rectify that because circulation is central to everything else, yes. our health will improve. Yes, imagine you know, what, what cells require. They require hydration, uh, waste removal, nutrition, gas exchange. Uh, it, everything really is a function of, of what's going on in the, uh, in the extracellular fluid uh, such that uh, this can occur within the cellular fluid. So it's literally every cell in our body can be affected yes. by optimal breathing. Yes. Wow. And every, every cell is literally dependent uh, on circulation. So yes, do we want our cells to have a happy face or do we want them to have a frowning face? Happy. <laughs> happy face, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, I know that you've been studying this for over 20 years now. Um, how, did you come, how did you come across this as a phenomenon? Well, it, um, I've, I've studied yoga, uh, martial arts, and breathing, primarily uh, Taoist breathing methods uh, for much of my life. During, during uh, some of those times, I was looking for uh, cultivating uh, fa jing and, and various uh, esoteric phenomena associated with tai chi practice and, uh, and raising kundalini and, and things like that. But um, around 1995, when uh, our family moved to Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, I equipped my office with instrumentation, including EEG instrumentation, a galvanic skin response, a body current or body impedance measurement, um, heart rate variability measurement, and um, and started out in pursuit of the uh, of the awakened mind, a brainwave pattern, and. I worked at that for several years uh, following Anna Wise's publications. Uh, Anna Wise bringing the awakened mind uh, from the UK to the US early on and really being the primary voice for uh, promoting the awakened mind brainwave pattern here in America. And um, I don't know, I worked at that every morning. I would get my EEG uh, all set up and uh, and work on meditation and elicitation of the awakened mind brainwave pattern in myself uh, using EEG and other simultaneous forms of biofeedback that my computer would be recording. And um, I got to the point where I could, I could elicit the awakened mind brainwave pattern in myself rapidly every time I sat down. Now, given that I was uh, controlling my internal state and that means hydration, uh, you know, proper rest, uh, uh, factors like this make a difference. And um, being able to do that, then I began, uh, I began signing up for uh, seminars with Anna Wise at Esalen Institute in, uh, south of San Francisco, where I attended several, several of those uh, week-long events and uh, would train with her on elicitation of the awakened mind using Mind Mirror, which is the which is the official instrument that one uh, uses to assess mind mirror. Uh, I adapted my, my own EEG to be able to do that uh, without a mind mirror. But um, yes, uh, I worked with her for a few seminars and then saw her in her office north of San Francisco to have her validate for me that uh, she was seeing awakened mind properly on the mind mirror and I demonstrated to her what I was doing and how I could turn it on and off like a switch. And uh, she acknowledged that, yes, uh, that was uh, what was going on with, uh, with my EEG and the mind mirror. And I described to her how I was doing this and I was doing it with controlling bridges. And uh, you know, we spent an afternoon together and then had tea and debriefed and uh, and that's the last time I saw Anna actually. And I never, I never really, um, I never really told this part of the coherent breathing story because I didn't want to disrupt her fragile existence and uh, economy. And uh, I didn't, I didn't write about it or really explain that this is how I came to understand uh, or discover coherent, coherent breathing uh, until 2014. 
uh, where I wrote an article about it. But uh, uh, the time is right now for really the, the whole story to come to light uh, because um, uh, this is fundamentally a method for elicit, eliciting the meditative mind and, uh, and the awakened mind, which I think humanity needs right now. Mm-hmm. For, for people who don't, uh, don't know much about brainwaves, what is the awakened mind brainwave pattern? It's a pattern that looks, uh, has uh, left and right symmetry. One place is the electrodes on occipital lobes one and two mm-hmm. and the ground of the forehead, uh, just two electrodes. <laughs> and the, uh, it produces a symmetrical uh, brainwave pattern on left and right that has beta with a certain amplitude, alpha with a greater amplitude, theta with a certain amplitude and delta with a certain amplitude. So it, it's a symmetrical pattern left and right that, uh, that emerges in the brainwave pattern when one is in this optimal state, which is essentially produced by breathing slowly, deeply, and rhythmically. F- uh, five minutes is what I locked onto and used for years mm. and uh, relaxation of, uh, of the six bridges. So if we were to put a EEG on a, on a monk, for example, would we see mm-hmm. something similar to the, to the awakened mind? Brain mind? Yes, yes. And, and in fact, uh, the book Zen in the Mind uh, is really, it's right here on the shelf behind me. It's one of the, uh, one of the best uh, books that I found on the subject when I was researching it uh, in, the, uh, in the latter part of the 90s. Uh, that book was out of print at the time. I had to round it up, uh, but I have a copy, and it's uh, it's really one of the best books ever written on the subject. Mm. But so yes, uh, they they instrumented monks uh, and uh, and then observed breathing patterns, etc., uh, that they were uh, involved in during the time of their EEG recordings. And so, based what coherent breathing is is a, is a way of almost just changing your breathing pattern and getting to that state of brainwave pattern that, that a monk might be in yes. after 30 years of practicing. That's correct. That's correct. In fact, before uh, we left North Carolina, uh, I had my EEG assessed uh, by Dan Chartier and uh, I was already demonstrating the, the meditative mind, if not the awakened mind at that time. And so when, when did um, that kind of the cardiac element of this come to your attention? Well, when I, met, uh, when I met Dee Edmondson, uh, RN and close colleague, uh, I met her in 2000, uh, where uh, we took our, our oldest son at the time for to be seen by Dee, who is a biofeedback professional and neurofeedback professional in particular. That means EEG, biofeedback. And um, uh, the day we arrived there, she and my son got to know each other, and she introduced him to to heart rate variability biofeedback in preparation for EEG biofeedback. Uh, Dee's really a pioneer in what I refer, refer to as multiple simultaneous forms of biofeedback mm-hmm. in session. So when a client moves into her chair, they have three or four different instruments on them simultaneously. So she's able to assess all, all matter of uh, nervous system status that way. and. Um, he sat down with the HRV instrument and uh, used it for five or 10 minutes. And I was there to observe. And I said, well, Dee, I'd really like to try that uh, when, <laughs> when he's finished. And uh, so she said, sure. And uh, I sat down and, and was breathing in my normal manner. And uh, I recall my HRV was a nice sinusoid at about 36 beats of variability uh, just from the outset. And uh, and uh, she said, well, how are you doing that? And I said, I'm breathing. And, uh, and from then on, uh, she and I began to investigate mm. in the relationship between breathing and EEG. And I, I told her that I had been working on the Awakened Mind Brainwave Protocol in which she was interested, of course. So had she never seen that kind of, that kind of sinusoidal HRV measure before? Well, uh, I think she had, but- uh, Not um, in a deliberate way. Yeah, not having been achieved the way that I had achieved it. Mm. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we then got uh, deeply into uh, the relationship between breathing, heart rate variability, and EEG. And um, 
course, that's that's kind of where I was uh, in my quest for the awakened mind brainwave pattern. But um, yeah, now uh, Dee and I went on the road after several years and we published the new science of breath in 2005, second edition in 2006, which had a major correction in it, by the way. Um, and uh, we went on the road to ISNR and AAPB annual events and, uh, and uh, described our research to others who, uh, who caught on very quickly, uh, kind of agreed in principle with where we were going and caught on very quickly. That was really the beginning of how, uh, how coherent breathing came to be known in the applied psychophysiology field. Mm. So, so there was almost a transference from that biofeedback field into the, into the, physiology, into the psychophysiology field. And well, uh, most psychophysiologists employ, employ biofeedback. That's really almost what psychophysiology is. It's, it's uh, psychology with biofeedback. And so what, what was the reaction from, um, from the kind of mainstream medical world around this? Well, there was a protocol out there for, uh, for heart rate variability uh, biofeedback. And we were offering a different take on, on heart rate variability, what it is, why it is, and uh, how to elicit it. And that was via uh, coherent breathing in effect. Mm. And um, I was, I was very, uh, very keen on diving deeper into the heart rate variability phenomenon and what it is and why it is. And of course, that ultimately led to uh, the discovery of the, uh, I won't call it the discovery, but the, uh, the modern day uh, discovery of the uh, Valsalva wave, which um, is generated by, uh, by the diaphragm moving up and down and the lungs uh, expanding with blood and uh, then ejecting that blood during exhalation. Yeah, so of this course, idea that the diaphragm is like the second heart. Yes. Could I, could uh, I ask, what, are you being modest by saying it's not a discovery or calling it the second discovery? Well, I, I say that because uh, the Yellow Emperor discovered it uh, 5,000 years ago. Uh, he knew of the respiratory arterial pressure wave and it's documented in the Yellow Emperor's Classic. Um, and then uh, Medical Physiology by Guyton and Hall is my, is my uh, encyclopedia of knowledge regarding the human body. And there is a paragraph that long in that book and a graphic image of the respiratory arterial pressure wave having been captured, uh, I think via catheterization um, where uh, Andre Cornand and company had invented a catheterization uh, uh, internally, you know, putting catheters in blood vessels and, and, and cavities and whatnot in the 50s. Mm. They won the uh, Nobel Prize for that. Okay. But um, yes, when um, uh, the funny story here is I, I, we published the New Science of Breath first edition in 2005. And a researcher and, and a practitioner at NIH emailed me and said, uh, hey, Steve, have you read this paper? And uh, he said, uh, I replied back to say no. And he said, I really highly recommend that you read it. And uh, it was a paper by Paul Lehrer and the, and the Vachillos uh, on uh, heart rate variability, the heart rate variability phenomenon and what it is and, and what resonance is. So I got that journal and read it right, right away and, uh, and realized that uh, I had things backwards and uh, went to work trying to detect the respiratory arterial pressure wave uh, using instrumentation that I built uh, along with other instruments that I so own. What, what was the difference, sorry, in Lara's work that made you think you got it backwards? Well, um, Lara explained that uh, heart rate variability is really a function of barrel reception, which I knew, um, but that the, uh, the blood flow, uh, I had written in the first edition that as the heart rate increases, the arterial blood flow increases. And as the heart rate decreases, the arterial blood flow decreases. A logical assumption for a, a novice in the field of heart rate variability. 
Um, but his article said uh, and described that uh, blood flow in the arterial tree increases with exhalation. Um, the ejection fraction increases, the heart rate slows down because more blood is moving through the left heart during exhalation and speeds up uh, uh, during inhalation. This all trying to keep uh, the blood pressure in balance. Uh, the way I think of it now, Tom, is, is that the exhalation phase of breathing is really about arterial blood flow and the inhalation phase of breathing is about venous blood flow. And this is what the heart is doing when we exhale and inhale. It's facilitating a large volume of blood leaving the lungs and, uh, and flowing into the arterial tree and then throughout the uh, capillary circulation. And then when we inhale, we bring back that blood from the capillary circulation through the venous tree, through the right heart and into the lungs. Uh, refilling them again. Mm. So yeah, I had it backwards and we corrected that in the second edition of two th uh, the New Science of Breath in 2006, and then went on to promote that understanding uh, over the course of uh, uh, six, eight years at, at various events. Um, in 2013, I presented uh, the search for the wave in the brain at the Dallas ISNR event. And uh, this was a, a big, big breakthrough. Uh, we, um, the, uh, the interesting uh, needle uh, here, Dee and I had been observing the EEG as a function of coherent breathing for a long time and had kind of gotten used to what we were seeing and should see. Um, Elsa Bear, another uh, friend and close colleague of Dee's and uh, my own, called me one day and uh, I had gotten to know her, her staff and trained them in the use of uh, valsalva wave biofeedback and coherent breathing with heart rate variability biofeedback. She called me and she said, I have to relate to you something. And that is that uh, when we have a client sit down in the treatment chair and instrument them and turn on vocal instructive sequence, she said, the very first breath they take and synchrony with that CD, we see alpha wave amplitude pop up in their EEG. And of course, alpha waves are well known to be the waves of, of uh, calm, uh, alert relaxation and uh, a lowering of anxiety. And um, I said, well, thank you, Elsa. You know, I, I, Dee and I see alpha rise, uh, you know, as as her clientele uh, begins coherent breathing, but your point is well taken that a single breath causes alpha amplitude to rise. And that, uh, like Morpheus, was a needle in my mind uh, for a long time. And um, uh, Tato Sakadze of, uh, of University of Louisville School of Medicine at that time, and I uh, decided to research this. Uh, his office was a few blocks from my dad's home in Louisville. So when I would visit my dad a few times a year, I'd spend uh, half a day with Tato and we would plot, uh, talk about our research and we hatched the, uh, the search for the wave in the brain. And the, the quest here, Tom, was uh, needed because while we could see the see coherent breathing uh, result in dramatic changes in the EEG, uh, in almost every instance of its application, uh, we could not see uh, the Valsalva wave in the EEG, uh, although it was visible really anywhere you can instrument the body, including the earlobes, uh, the nose, the tongue, uh, the lips, you know, all over the head. Mm. The question was, why are we not seeing uh, a, an EEG uh, component that's at 0 0.085 hertz, that of the uh, of coherent breathing? end of the Valsalva wave when one is breathing coherently. And uh, so we set about to research that and find out why. And the suspicion was that, that it was being uh, eliminated by uh, low frequency filtering that had been embedded in EEG instruments almost from time immemorial back, uh, dating back to Elmer and Alice Green. Their work. Does the, um, just as a novice question here, um, does the, um, is it, is it harder just to measure blood waves in the brain because it's encased in the skull? 
Well, um, we were looking for electrical activity. Um, the EEG is uh, it's electrical waves being generated by the wave, uh, mm -hmm. by the brain. And those are visible through the skull with electrodes attached uh, to the head with a conductive gel. Mm -hmm. um, but um, from an, a, a plethysmographic point of view where you put a clip on, on the ear, uh, it, uh, the blood wave in the brain was not visible through the skull. Yeah. And that problem was solved uh, via uh, hemoencephalography. And uh, with, with one of those instruments, uh, I did my part of the research on the search for the wave in the brain where I could observe the Valsava wave at my earlobe and the blood flow in my brain looking through my skull with, with uh, uh, that instrument. And they correlated exactly. And uh, Tato's work was to instrument his clients with a 128 channel um, EEG, which covers your head with electrodes mm. and have them breathe coherently uh, with uh, Valsava wave uh, pro also attached to the earlobe uh, where he was looking for electrical waves in, uh, in the EEG. And in both of our cases, we took the low frequency filtering out that had been implemented in both of those instruments. And there it was. And the amplitude of it uh, from an EEG perspective is 10 times the amplitude of functional bands. And this is the reason that it had been eliminated with low frequency filtering early on it's because the goal of Elmer and Alice Green and others was to, was to really observe the functional bands and understand uh, their importance and significance and how to train those. But, so given, uh, given what you <laughs> said um, about the, uh, the researcher who was finding this, as soon as they breathe coherently, that first wave, you get the alpha waves in the brain. Does yes. this suggest then that it's the actual Valsalva wave causing that surge yes. in alpha waves? Yes, but we couldn't, it, it made sense, Tom, that if, if, the, uh, if the Valsalva wave were washing through the brain, that would, we would see a big electrical wave uh, in the brain as well. And we weren't, uh, we hadn't seen it on any EEG machines. And uh, the, way that, uh, the way that we could see it using Valsalva wave pro was to take low frequency filtering out of a heart rate variability biofeedback machine. Mm. And that allowed us to see all the way down to DC uh, direct current. In other words, uh, zero hertz, uh, you know, up to a couple of hundred hertz. So by removing that, we could see it uh, uh, in, uh, in the skin, in the capillary circulation, anywhere you put a, a clip. And the, the same made sense that we should see it uh, in the brain. But um, Herschel Tuman, who invented that, uh, that instrument that could look through the skull into the brain, he and I uh, discussed this uh, before his passing. And he said that um, he didn't think it was a function of low frequency filtering, although there was low frequency filtering in his instrument, that he thought that the brain micromanaged blood flow for, uh, for purposes of uh, of constancy of brain function. But um, yeah, uh, I was able to obtain an instrument uh, from his company that had the low frequency filtering removed at my request. And there it was. And, uh, and Tato did the same thing for an EEG machine at the University of Louisville. And there it was. So now uh, I, I have a saying now that says knowledge that the Valsalva wave washes through the brain with every exhalation and inhalation, changes everything we know. Mm. It changes what, what, what we know about heart rate variability. It changes what we know about meditation. It changes what we know about circulation, about all brain function. Uh, you, may, uh, you may have seen in one of my videos where University of Rochester found in the 2012 timeframe, uh, this was in mice, that the heartbeat causes uh, CNS to wash through the brain with every beat, where uh, cerebrospinal fluid cleanses the brain of, of metabolic uh, uh, solutes and whatnot, including amyloid beta and uh, tau, uh, the, the uh, plaques associated with Alzheimer's. 
So uh, imagine now that the wave activity or the pressure differential on the arterial and venous sides of the brain double when you breathe coherently and, uh, and also create a, a, a washing wave action. In, um, in kind of common language, um, is that gonna kind of keep my brain younger by cleaning it almost? Yes, I believe so. I believe it keeps every cell in the, in the body younger. Wow. But in particular, those in the brain, because we hold the brain above the chest and heart. So blood has to flow upward against gravity. It doesn't have any problem flowing downward to gra toward gravity, but it has a problem flowing upward uh, against gravity. This takes me on to uh, my question that I've been really looking forward to, which is your recent experiment on a giraffe um, and what it tells us. Could you, could you tell me a little bit about how that came about? Uh, yes. Uh, so this was the hypothesis then from 2013 on. And um, at that event, uh, the ISNR event in Dallas, Dee took some photographs of me with a giraffe in the toy store there, the gift shop. Uh, because she knew I wanted, to, I wanted to see the Valsava wave in a giraffe's head because uh, for many decades, all through the 1900s, uh, there was uh, research performed on giraffes, largely by a Dutch team of researchers, uh, where they had uh, many attempts to understand how uh, the giraffe can, can exist because uh, physically its head is too far above its chest and heart for blood to make it to the giraffe's brain and therefore for it to exist at all. It's because the neck's so long. Yes, because the neck is so long. And, um, and the heart, the giraffe's heart is no larger uh, relative to its body mass than any other land dwelling vertebrate. So uh, they, mm, Many giraffes were sacrificed to science to understand how this could be. And to my knowledge, as of uh, the 2017 timeframe, the riddle had not been solved. But uh, the research papers I've read on this subject uh, are, they're absent uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is that, uh, that the giraffe has the largest diaphragm of any land dwelling animal. But the diaphragm uh, size or even contribution to circulation in the studies is missing. Um, some of the studies had giraffes hanging in, in, uh, in slings and the sling would be across their abdomen holding their, their feet off the ground. Now imagine uh, how that hampers the inhalation and exhalation uh, and expansion and contraction of the rib cage when the weight of the giraffe is hanging on its, you know, on its uh, uh, torso and uh, rib cage. So um, I think this, this was misguided. So this and, uh, and I thought that the giraffe was the, uh, was the compelling test case for the evolutionary imperative for the, uh, the thoracic pump uh, to move uh, blood to the brain. Uh, in humans and in general in erect, in erect uh, vertebrate life, especially mammalian life. So yes, in 2017, I had reached out to the Dallas Zoo and introduced myself, told them of my research, told them of my theory and hypothesis. And in 2017, they invited me to come down and participate in a, uh, in a hoof trimming procedure where they'd, they had to sedate a given giraffe that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't cooperate without sedation. So uh, a team of about 20 of us, uh, zoo personnel and myself, uh, were uh, there with the giraffe during this process. And I was there um, with my Valsalvoy Pro clip, which is really optimized for placing on the earlobe, um, and uh, another one in case I needed it. But I didn't know how this was going to work out uh, given that I had to place it on the giraffe quickly and, and gain some readings in just a few minutes while the giraffe was under sedation. And um, the way they, they did this was the, they lowered the giraffe gently to the ground after sedation 
while holding its head erect and then leaning its head up against a, uh, like a ladder, a wooden pyramid so that its neck was still elevated and its head was still about uh, uh, seven feet off the ground. And uh, its face was right here in front of me and its tongue was flaccid and hanging straight down. And uh, I turned to uh, the hospital uh, uh, staff that was aiding me and I said, can I place the clip on her tongue? And she said, sure. So we got a tissue and dried the tip of her tongue off. And I placed the clip on the tip of her tongue, turned it on and I had a laptop and began observing what I was seeing. And from the very instant I connected it, I began to, to see what I thought I would see. Um, no video was allowed and no uh, audio recording was allowed, but I was timing her inhalation and exhalation. And I was watching what was going on with the, the blood wave rising and falling in her tongue. And it turned out that the wave rose when she exhaled, which is the way it does with humans. But then it also rose again when she inhaled, which tells us that the inhalation is so powerful that it's creating a vacuum in the, uh, in the jugular vein up into and through the head and, uh, and then on to affect the blood, upward blood flow in the carotid artery, creating a vacuum in effect that is facilitating blood flow through the giraffe's brain all the time. Wow. And that is how it was able to evolve to its current stature. Amazing. And so given that the giraffe couldn't exist without the diaphragm, without this yeah. huge diaphragm, that's yeah. essentially evidence that, you know, your theories about the thoracic pump and the, our diaphragms being so important to our circulation. Yes. It, it gives it a lot of weight, doesn't it? Yes, I think so. I thought it was, uh, you know, it was the acid test for yeah. the theory. And um, to my knowledge, it had not, this had not been discovered previously. So I, I found it uh, immensely gratifying that the, uh, the theory held up uh, in my, my one examination, yeah. uh, which, is, which is hard to get. Um, it's uh, hard to become and get invited into these things, uh, you know, and uh, then it's hard to get the opportunity. Yeah. But it, uh, it all worked out well. Uh, uh, so Jade really, uh, really helped me confirm the theory, if you will. Jade's the name of the giraffe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it, an 18 year, uh, year old female giraffe. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, we've not got much time left, I don't think, for, for, for many more questions. But I wanted to ask you, do you think because you're um, not a researcher in the traditional sense of being tied to a university, that's allowed you more freedom to think outside of existing paradigms? And we're at a point where you might may even change uh, some paradigms that exist in those institutions? Uh, yes, my sister's had a, and I speak about this a lot, she's a, a, a traditional Chinese medical doctor and, um, and a homeopath. And uh, we, we talk about how um, some of these ideas are very counter to the current perspective in Western medicine and, and uh, other uh, medical venues. And um, how, if I had attended medical school, would I have been able to see past what I was taught uh, in medical school or uh, in veterinary school for that matter, or any other, uh, any other um, paradigm of, of way of seeing the world? Um, I really credit this practice, if you will, which, you know, I've been engaged in practices like this for much of my life, but I, I, uh, I credit these practices to helping me be able to see um, and intuit uh, beyond uh, what's on paper. For that reason, I, I have a lot of inventions. And uh, Is there an, an invention or a discovery that you're most proud of? Well, I would say... Um, in the, in the realm of psychophysiology, the, the, uh, the detection of bio, and biofeedback of the Valsalva wave is it. Yeah. Um, I, have, uh, I have some other uh, patents pending right now, one of which I'm most proud of, uh, but I can't speak to it. <laughs> well, I look forward to interviewing you about that when, we, when we're allowed to hear about it.
Yeah, it's it's more about physics and electronics, so it's uh, it's in that realm. Was there a, a moment when you became really interested in Chinese medicine, or it, does that come from your sister's interest? Did she inspire you to to become interested in? Well, I've uh, I've been interested in Chinese martial arts uh, from as far back as I can remember, and um, and have practiced Chinese martial arts to the extent I was able. I had the good fortune uh, to learn from uh, Yang Ching Fu's niece, uh, to learn Yang style Tai Chi from Yang Ching Fu's niece in Ottawa, Ontario, uh, when I lived there, and uh, and uh, also Yang Jun Do and uh, and uh, his nephew uh, Yang Jun. I attended seminars with them in Maryland for several years in a row, and immersed myself in it to the extent I could. And, uh, and then, yes, of course, my sister introduced me to a medical Qigong uh, in, the, in the 80s, early 80s, and uh, acupuncture and uh, herbs. And uh, I've, I've read as much as possible on that subject uh, on my own as well. Yes, right now, my sister is, uh, is an OMD, and my wife's sister is an OMD. Uh, she just graduated, so uh, wow. yeah, it kind of runs in the in the broader yeah, family. Obviously, as well. in the uh, in the Elliott family, there. <laughs> yeah. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been really enlightening and uh, amazing. I can't wait to see what people make of your research. Thank you very much, Tom. A uh, uh, great pleasure. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did and you want to see more videos with Stephen, I have done another interview with him where we talk specifically about tips for getting the most out of your coherent breathing practice. Both Stephen and I are going to be talking at the Breathing Festival, which is online this year, so you can come wherever you are in the world. I'll leave resources down below to the music that we were talking about, uh, as well as Stephen's websites and everything that you would need to know more about coherence is going to be down there. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like. It really helps the channel. And if you want to know more about breathing, then subscribe because I'm going to be interviewing lots more breathing experts through the year. Bye.